Good morning, everyone. You can hear me. I, I, shall I speak louder? It's good. Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I know I'm in Hamburg, not in Hamburg. Sorry for the <laughs> misspelling. I'm dyslexic, unfortunately, and I only see these things afterwards. Shortly, I will give you like a... I was, ju I was just going to dive into specifics of the work we do for some time. First, I will focus on how we deal with data and what data means in our context, how difficult it is to even think what data is really when we start our investigations. And then I tell you a little bit how difficult it is actually to use data and data-based storytelling to engage public, general public, audiences of different kinds, and how we try to break that ice using other formats where the data is not the forefront of the narratives, but is a solid kind of backbone of the stories we tell. And if you have any questions, you can ask them when I'm speaking at any time. I, I, I don't mind being interrupted, by the way. It actually helps me. I feel like somebody is listening. Uh, and that's, that's that, I think. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, first of all. Uh, it is interesting to be non-scholar, non-academic, but rather practitioners talking about you know work that you do and and kind of know the context uh, probably better than I do. So I'm not going to use a lot of jargon, maybe a little bit of my own, but that's going to be a new for you. Um, just a year before Cambridge Analytica, and I assume you heard about Cambridge Analytica is a company that doesn't exist anymore who got access to Facebook data. Facebook doesn't sell user data. They got an access to other ways and were able to scrape millions of data sets. Uh, and they were claiming that they can do different forms of influence during their election processes by advising political actors to uh, give them methods and tools of influencing. And there are different kinds of known for the sector as well from A-B testing to you name it, whatever. Uh, but also psychological profiling, et cetera. We don't know if these tactics or methods are working. There's no proof of any kind, except there's a suspicion that some of these tactics help to elect Donald Trump to, to the office or maybe even uh, contributed to Brexit in the UK. That's when they were used. So we started before that and we created uh, this kind of a project called Personal Data Political Persuasion, where we did two things. So first of all, when you look at what we call influence industry. We, we make an assumption that as a group of actors, mostly companies that somehow master some kind of methods and tactics and they offer them as pay for services and people buy them because they believe they're gonna work. And if they're gonna work or not, I don't care really. What is important is that there's a belief that certain use of data can produce certain political power. And it may not work now, it may work in the future. It all depends on quality of tools, people using them, context, and so on, et cetera. So, of course, there's no data set. I cannot go to Wikipedia and search for, you know, uh, in influence industry, give me a list of top companies, and so on. So our approach was, okay, Let's go to different conferences, places, online and non-online, where people talk about different formats of influencing, not necessarily political, but in advertisement and other methods of uh, gathering some kind of a know-how about how to turn random data about random users in random places into something coherent that then can be then turned into product. And as a result of this, you know, years of working, we created this... Uh, Influence industry database. Um, I actually, you, you may see that I'm showing you QR codes at some slides. Feel free to scan them and just explore the project. I'm not gonna like dive into them very deeply, but you can do that and don't listen to me anymore. It's fine. Um, so right now we have over 500 companies in the database that is based on this kind of uh, data sets that we claim is valid because this is what the companies tell themselves to their clients what they are capable of doing. And we extract that from their web presence, from their talks, videos, and so on, etc. And you can search them uh, by different uh, means. The other output is that we got data sets from UK and US because um, political parties have to report who, which services they buy for how much money for what reason. It's not always, you know, 
what they say is not necessarily what they do, uh, but we know that this party bought this services from this company and it's also in the database. So it's some, somehow verified. Uh, we don't know the efficacy of this, uh, of course. I'm not claiming that. Uh, but we know that there's an industry of large scale, there's a lot of money being pumped into it, and there's a claim that uh, they interfere uh, between political parties and opinion making, influencing people, uh, not necessarily voting for A or B, but also often though they claim that they can suppress engagement of the voters, if you like. So that was of our interest. Uh, we then turn it into different kinds of visualizations. This is part of the object we did for Futurium. And the Futurium, which is you know this kind of technology science museum in Berlin, we did a piece that is, I don't have a picture of that for some reason, uh, is uh, a physical object that a uh, visitor can interact with the avatar that looks like AI, but it isn't. It's more like Eliza kind of thing, it's pre-coded. And uh, those are all 210 different methods and tactics that the companies are offering. The object is only focusing on three of them and it's actually helping people, the visitors that are unaware of this entire spectrum of problem, uh, to engage with three methods that they use by trying to learn them for themselves to improve their visibility on social media and so on, etc. And through that they learn uh, how they work. Uh, we also try to use it to explain how this kind of profiling can work when trying to influence opinions around crises. We're looking at five types of crises that we know that are essential for voters in Europe. So around war, climate change, migration, health, and, uh, and so on. Um, this is a kind of a joke uh, a situation that is kind of simplifying the, 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 the meaning of influencing, if you like. So that's one of the projects that scan the code and, and see. And important part of this is here that we are actually creating data set partially arbitrarily. So we decide how we, you know, uh, index and qualify the data and the companies may not agree with how we uh, um, tag them in our database, what they do, what they offer and so on. Um, that's, that's one project. The second project is a different one. Again here, the data set is even more ephemeric. Uh, during COVID pandemic, we decided to see if there are new trends and new patterns of what kind of technologies are emerging are there any uh, transgressions happening between private sector and public sector through the means of technology where private companies can offer services and access to data that the state doesn't have but needs because you know they have to mitigate the impact of COVID not only on health but also work, economy, education, and so on, etc. So we did it as it was kind of a uh, we got a fellowship from Onazis Foundation that enabled us to do that. And in here, we really have to, you know, mostly go online and uh, YouTube and other means uh, where companies were producing a lot of output, trying to sell their services. Most of the services that we're offering were pivots. So the, the technology or the application already have existed. It just get a new framing. Uh, so it's good for you know, detecting who is sick or it is good for uh, managing spaces so people can do things in these spaces that is safe for, for them. The major idea here was, uh, so this is a kind of more artistic archive. It only presents 100 products out of the larger database of 400 different products that we have had. And we decided not to focus on, you know, scanners, drones, go this uh, this way that usually we look at technology by how technology is described by te technical people, but rather see what the specific technologies are actually doing. And then all of these technologies were about different forms of monitoring the host, which is the, the person, not the virus, that the, the, the impossible. And we didn't look at, of course, the uh, vaccine makers, we didn't look at the, all of the other stuff that was about the contact, etc. That, that was not that interesting. The interesting was how it affects education, our you know living and working in different spaces and so on, etc. And it's divided in these four categories: observing, sensing, mitigating, and modifying, which you can you can search this database. It has a lot of videos there, uh, descriptions, and so on, etc. It's a historical archive, you know, things turn around differently. Uh, but I think the the four major forms of Looking at it for us was, let's stop 
talking to people and looking at uh, data. Data is a main concept that is often used by the companies themselves when they sell their services. There's always, you know, we have the big data, we have the best data, we have the whatever data and so on. And they internally, the companies that we've been looking at their materials, very often interchangeably use the word intelligence, not just data. So we decided that intelligence is much more interesting words to talk about because it's more loaded. Uh, it's more meaningful, if you like. If you think about data, you feel about Excel sheet if you're not data person. If you think about intelligence, you're like, hmm, is it smart? Is it surveillance? You know, what is it? Um, but for us, it was interesting to see that we divided this data set into four categories of ambient intelligence. This is an intelligence that doesn't care about the individual entity in the data set. So it's not about personal, like they don't care who you are, if you like, what they care, how the masses of people are moving, behaving, and so on, et cetera, on social media, but also in the real space. You could see mobility reports from Google and so on that came out and we, we all discovered that all of these companies have very precise location data that they were claiming for a long time they don't, for example. Um, and mobility is part of that, but it's very specific part of it because it's, not on, it's also much more personalized. The behavioral intelligence and biometric intelligence, so biometric is the opposite of the ambient. It is all about, you know, smart, smart things that you were wearing or surrounded by. Or uh, behavioral is mostly about what kind of services they offer to live in the new normal. Well, what is the new normal? You can apply that to COVID, because you can apply that to climate change. That for us is like a secondary issue. So I'm going to speed up because I'm probably talking too much. Um, the, the third investigation is interesting because um, we actually purchase a data set. So we have nothing to do with the data set. We just bought it. For 136 euro, we bought 1 million profiles uh, of people using uh, dating services. We did it with Jana Moll, artist from Spain. You can explore this project. And it's legal. We didn't do any black market, you know, dark stuff and tour and whatever. Uh, we went to the official website of uh, US date and uh, we bought it with the you know credit card transaction and we downloaded the CVS file with attachments and the attachments for example had five million this million data sets had five million photographs if you like and the data was very precise you know from addresses names preferences blah blah whatever um, and it, co it cost very little, but also it took, you know, minutes to, to figure it out. The project is divided into two categories. So one is the artistic, this is the on the left, and then is the investigation. And I'm not going to talk about that a lot. It was just that there were two learnings from, from this. So the artistic project is exploring the data set without victimizing the people. So then, you know, faces are blurred. You can report if you can recognize somebody. And there's no access, direct access to the data set. So you, you cannot search for yourself or whoever. However, you, you are being served with snapshots of data sets that are random and temporary, and there's no way you can find anybody there. I mean, the probability you're gonna find them is like finding you know, life in space, I guess. Um, it may happen. Um, however, the, the investigation was interesting because what we, uh, what Diana and our team did, we did like a metadata analysis, exit files analysis of the pictures, et cetera, and we figured out the, the source of the data was plenty of fish. And we were like, plenty of fish, who is that? And then, and then we figured out that actually plenty of fish didn't even own that data, but the data appeared in many different dating sites to the reverse image search and so on, et cetera. We figured out that this data set basically is originating from one of the dating sites probably, but then it's been shared among many other dating sites. So the clear business model here is, and we discovered that, that all of these companies are, are basically owned by uh, one company that also owns media services. You can, you can search the, look at the investigation. Uh, so that was one, one layer that basically, uh, that's not unusual, that there's a, a one owner of a very convoluted network of different kind of entities that uh, suggest to the user that they are very different to each other. Like you think that one dating site is different to the other one. They have the same owner, they uh, look at the same data and so on. You're welcome to explore it. The other thing we discovered that they have a secondary business model on top of that. That is, each of these websites is serving third-party cookies that are very intrusive. So they also collect data from your use of the services 
uh, on the top of what you're giving to the service itself by inserting data yourself. So, uh, and we find out about 300 different companies present in this you know, entire sphere through the uh, intrusive cookies that are present on these websites. And for us, that was you know, kind of a big deal. And we did some press releases get, you know, uh, to press, and nobody was interested. And the reason they're not interested in it is uh, it's because it's the same business model of which media are living. It's exactly the same. Uh, when it comes to cookies and collecting data and, and, and presenting advertisement and so on. So that was another investigation. Um, the last one I'm going to show you is, is, a, is a slightly different one. That's, um, we've been doing that for like 10 years now where we thought that it would be interesting to see what kind of companies are being bought on inv or invested by the big five tech companies. So GAFAM it stands for uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple, and, and Microsoft. The, it has different abbreviations. Sometimes you add other companies to it, including Chinese and so on. We focus on GAFAM because we have access to, to the data set-ish. So like, in the, we couldn't buy the data. I mean, you can kind of find it in different places, uh, but what was interesting here was that that data is very unreliable. So you can learn about that company X, like Google bought company B, whatever, and they bought it for this amount of money and probably for this reason. And that's usually is reported by the press, but if any of this is true, if that's the total amount of money, did they buy it for, the software they are buying, the hardware they are buying, people they were buying, did they buy it because of the patents the company had, or they buy it because they were killing competition, or they were disabling competition from other companies who could have bought them and then killed the company afterwards. That is never found in the data set. Like this is not possible to do. And also the descriptions of the companies are very tricky. So we did like a very thorough analysis initially of how they tag the, the kind of types of businesses to see what kind of clusters are, because we thought, Maybe through looking at these acquisitions and investments, we can learn something about strategies and politics of the companies that is not in the public discourse. So that is, you know, we all know now that Google is not search engine only. We know that Facebook is not the social you know, network, never was actually, and so on. Or Amazon is not the shop. Actually, the biggest money they do is on AWS, which is the, the, the cloud, that they, is the biggest cloud right now that most of the services rely on. Uh, but they also invest in other things. So we could see from this data set that there's some competition around entering new markets, education, health, robotics, na na na. But we didn't know we, we can trust the data. So we, we hire some people, we work with the density design, and we did analysis, which is that how, this is how the data is presented. And then uh, we hire some researchers to go back to the source documents and rewrite the tagging. And so then on the actual website, you can go and see this kind of uh, petty dish, pet, petty dish kind of situation of infographics where you can see how the company presents itself or it's being presented by the tech media and then slide the slider around and see what exactly they are. And then you, you can see that, you know, Google, Amazon and Facebook and Apple and Microsoft are very different beasts if you look at them through the lens of acquisitions and investments. Now, this is really boring story. Like all of these stories, except dating that you are excited about, uh, are kind of boring, uh, data-wise. Uh, they they're not engaging. They don't they don't tell you neither how to understand the world they represent, but also what you can do as an individual. Then they usually are quite disempowering, if you like. So, I'm going to start from this project to tell you how we work about stuff very quickly, and I'm just going to shut up. So. Um, this is another way of looking at the same data. We extracted the only acquisitions and initial investment, but when we dumped the investment, because it was an impossible task, um, the entire data set of the GAFAM empire a year and a half ago when we launched the final one with the density design had 1,210 acquisitions, uh, which is not huge, it's not big data, but it's big enough to be complicated. Um, and we decided to do different kinds of projects. So the initial, I'm going to go from the top left, is the first take on kind of Google acquisition and investments represented in this kind of, you know, sculpture in one of our exhibitions of, you know, basically it's like bar chart, but 3D, not very engaging. Uh, then we did this map, we know where you are, which is this kind of uh, bubble network representation of acquisitions and investments 
uh, at the time of all Google around 2016. Uh, that is physical object made of nails and threads and so on, etc. And that was extremely engaging. We gave people magnifying lens and you can go around and see. The color coding is, this is not a very good quality photograph, is about you know different clusters like education, robotics, and so on. Uh, then we went into another experiment when we were trying to show the relationship between Google and us, you know, how we see Google and how Google sees us on two ends. And we created this kind of convoluted uh, object that was fantastic and beautiful, has little plastic people representing number of users. Because our point was that Google through its services covers about 70% of anybody and everybody connected to internet. Uh, right, and so it is a massive lens that we have insight into different kinds of inner doings of how society operates and works, and we're trying to represent it this way. It was a disaster. Uh, then we created the poster uh, that we mostly work with educators and the object called Google and You that become very popular. And uh, I don't know if it actually explains anything, but it makes people much more curious and much more interested in exploring their relationship that is presented usually through the screen of the mobile phone and the Google Eye that is capable of, through the network of all the companies that they also own, to have this fantastic net of intelligence gathering that we are not aware of. Um, and the principle here was to make you aware, uh, I think that Google is much bigger than the 10 apps that you have on your phone. That is hundreds of apps of different kinds, and many of them you not even know that they are. People don't even know that you know Instagram is Facebook, so uh, it's, it's, it's very complicated. Um, what we do with that, uh, in terms of engagement, last few minutes. Um, this is like a totally different approach. So I just wanted to share you that if we do some public engagement, it is based on very thorough, problematic, and interesting investigations that we uh, actually do with different actors, partners, etc. But when it comes to public engagement, we have two formats. One is how to engage people in big cities like you know, London, Paris, uh, Paris we, didn't, we didn't do, but London, uh, New York, San Francisco, and Berlin. And, uh, and how to then engage people in small towns, villages, and so on. Uh, what are the kind of means for creating or taking over spaces? So our major discovery was that there's a lack of public spaces in which anybody can actually ask personal questions around technology. They just don't exist. And institutions, organizations that are, whose role could be of offering that kind of response, they're not equipped to do that. Libraries, schools, community centers, art centers, and so on, et cetera. They don't have enough knowledge, if you like. So well, our discovery was to, to use, so first of all, what we decided to do a classical culture jamming, and we went after Apple. Uh, this is Apple on the you know, bottom right, and this is you know, people queuing in the Apple and uh, getting the new iPhone. And this is the kind of uh, uh, initial ideas. You now, uh, Apple store looks very differently now, but it used to be wide and clean spaces. Now it's more nature and wood and so on. And we came after this computer uh, advertisement. So the whole aesthetic was created this kind of way, including the, they, they have the Genius Bar, you know, with the Freedom Fighters in the background as if, you know, the, Apple store was offering anything there, except telling you that they can't fix your old equipment because it's two years old. Um, so we, we decided to recreate the space and recreate the model. We had engineers, we had the, the data detox bar, and we had a space. We started from a small iteration of it, um, the kind of you know mini version that then turned into much larger uh, New York. This is just one of the rooms, uh, London, and then uh, San Francisco where we took over massive, you know, multi-thousand square meters space that was a former headquarters of the Converse store. Um, the narratives there are ready-mades, where we present the work of companies themselves that shows normalization of, you know, how technology is uh, entering different spaces that we actually are not very aware of that uh, role of interference. The, Artists work that mostly focuses on the relationship between individual and the technology, why we are so dependent and, and uh, you know, uh, uncritical about technology, and also the big tech, obviously, that I show you some of the examples. And people explore them in different ways. Um, you see some of the words I showed you before. Uh, this is the queue in New York. One of the things we also offer there is data detox kit and data detox bar. 
uh, because we didn't want to be like the title of her loving book, which is uh, design in San Francisco, made in China and criticized in Europe. So uh, that's just not the approach we wanted to offer. So the idea was that whoever comes to our critical spaces that we culture jam, Apple store kind of situation or high tech design store, not necessarily just Apple store, uh, design store, people can walk away with something that we call data detox kit, which is mostly focusing on capturing you as a user where you are without criticizing where you are with your tech your understanding or dependencies, et cetera, and giving you a very basic guidance on how you can look where you are, rather how you should change. Because that's kind of patronizing, we thought uh, at the time, and then we still do. So and this, this content then we turn into different narratives uh, that are paper based and very low tech based. And uh, that people can print on a home printer, on a larger printer, on a plotter, they can go to a studio and do the, you know, big banner and so on, depending on the resources of the partner we work with. And here the idea that we, that we use the term anchor institutions, those are institutions, organizations, not necessarily formal, that are embedded in the communities in different places. Uh, libraries are a good example, community centers, uh, you know, crypto parties uh, as an example of informal one, who would like to have some assets to be able to engage the, their own public and their own audience in the discussions that it's very hard for them to engage them with. So these assets are partially coming from uh, our own work, but many of them are actually produced uh, with the partners uh, as well. The example here would be, those is just kind of you know, from Lithuania, from Helsinki and from uh, Brazil, different iterations. Uh, they look differently when the resources are much lower, when they become more kind of, you know, small paper on the wall, uh, workshop scenario and, and so on, et cetera. So it is very analog and there's no digital. We don't kind of assume that people will have a projector or tablets and other things. All this content we have is available digitally. As you could see, we can do that. But we just know that it won't help in this kind of circumstances. And also is kind of repetition of what we're trying to be critical of. So, you know, let's, you know, let's be critical of the screen by looking at the screen kind of situation. We want to avoid that. So it's, it's mostly analog. Um, and some people take the, the adaptation localization so far away that you would not recognize that to be the part of the same data detox. Uh, they just use different metaphors that are much more resonating with the, with the audiences they're dealing with, uh, different colors, uh, aesthetics and everything and, and so on. And this is, this is how we, how we work. So this work, Number wise, the big exhibitions we get like they usually last three weeks and we have about 30,000 people visiting in this short period of time, which is huge. Uh, but those are urban people from urban spaces for whom it is cool to come to this environment. And I respect you know, them as users, but they're very privileged. Uh, so uh, what we much more happy with is how we spread this uh, through the collaboration with uh, about, I think now around 100 partners around the world. Uh, this is the number of events and, and countries and visitors that we have had like I don't know, four months ago. It's probably different now. Uh, how it spreads, where we often don't know who the audience is because our theory of change here is to equip and empower the anchor institutions rather than us coming in and, uh, you know, pretending that we understand any context in which that stuff is operating. So just to, just to finish, that was much longer than 20 minutes, no? No, it's about half an hour, actually, it's fine. Um, so last thing maybe for discussion, we did an exhibition called Everything Will Be Fine, and there's a title of this talk is Everything Will Be Fine. Um, and the exhibition is based on the experiences that I show you, all the investigations, all the engagements, and uh, actually talking to different uh, entities and partners about data technology and, and society. And this exhibition was focusing on how technology, digital technology in particular, through how it become ubiquitous, it is actually affecting the way we understand and imagine reacting to a crisis. It's not only technology as a solution and so on, but technology is actually either expanding, some people would say, some people would say limiting the way we can comprehend what crisis is. 
and so on. And we explored that through, I don't know, 70 different works of uh, artists and collaborators and researchers and so on, etc. And we divided the content into these four categories. How, and they intertwine. It's not like you're just panicking or you're just, you know, uh, lunatic believing that we're going to land on Mars and everything's going to be solved. Uh, it's more about that this is this personal thread, kind of a silver line between us and technology that makes it somehow believable and personal that we have a lot of fears and that is the panic that is going to destroy. Privacy is a good example. Um, that it actually can help us to carry on our own investigations and we can be tactical about use of technology and we imagine that technology can help us to care about ourselves, other people, uh, planet and so on. We also be, believe often that technology through kind of new in, inventive ways of how it is proliferating is uh, countering existing systems of you know democracy how we operate institutions etc and they should be replaced they should be changed and, and so on etc so it is forcing us to doubt that what we have worked over centuries of society technology not only can question but also can offer other solutions and the digital hub is about basically technology as a form of preparation escape and so on that we often see uh, happening and that's Kind of a conclusion, and I would just uh, see if, uh, how the conversation is going. <laughs>